the reading today is Genesis 3, 1 to 19. Uh, that's on page 5 of your church Bibles or in your booklet, I think, page 15. Uh, okay, good. Got it? Uh, now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the snake deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the snake, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe with painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here to be continuing our uh, sermon series on the first chapters of Genesis. I've got a big one. <clears throat> The fall, the, one of the best-known stories in the Bible, maybe the best-known story in the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve, the serpent and the fruit. So we're in for a really optimistic, um, you know, happy-go-lucky sort of, sort of sermon. Um, I want to begin this morning by asking you a uh, question. Why do you go to church? What brought you here this morning? There are lots of reasons. We all have different reasons, maybe. Uh, the reasons we think we're coming and Maybe the reasons God has are not always the same, but um, uh, maybe it's for community. Maybe it's because you have some burden you need lifted. Maybe it's just a kind of habit. Maybe you just want to worship God. But I think one reason we come to church, I think one reason maybe today, is that in addition to all of these things, Christianity helps us to make sense of the world and of our lives. We go to church to learn about what life means, about what it's all about, and about our place in all of this. And that's one thing that faith really does provide, some powerful answers to these basic human questions. So, for example, we learn at church, we learn in Christianity that the world is good. We learn that God created a good world, full of meaning and purpose. The world is not arbitrary or random or empty or meaningless. Your life has meaning. Your life is worth something. That is something we learn uh, at church. Another thing that we learn, that Christianity teaches us, is that love is the most important thing in the world. God is love, and God loves us. And this means that love is at the heart of all 
things. That love is sort of the central beam in the fabric of reality. It's a very exciting idea. We are all loved by God to our core no matter what, and it is this love that called us into existence. So these are some of the kinds of things you can learn. But there's another big thing about Christianity, uh, a big truth about the nature of things to help us understand our lives in the world that, that is maybe not quite so easy to latch onto, not quite so immediately positive. Um, along with teaching that creation is deeply and inalterably good and grounded in love, Christianity also teaches us, the Bible also teaches us, that the world has gone deeply wrong. It teaches that there is a deep flaw in all human beings and that the world is no longer the way that it was meant to be. In theology, we call this the doctrine of the fall, or perhaps even more scarily, the doctrine of original sin. It's the doctrine of humanity's fall from grace. And our passage today from Genesis is the text that lies at the heart of this profound and fundamental Christian teaching. But of all the major Christian ideas out there, I think it is perhaps the doctrine of the fall which is, uh, that has become the hardest for modern people to, to swallow, the hardest pill to swallow, at least on the surface. Certainly there are a few areas where Christianity seems to be more countercultural in terms of, you know, you go to, I, I have kids, we, every single kid's movie ends with, you know, just believe in yourself and make good choices, you know, and the doctrine of the fall is pretty much the opposite of that direction in thinking about the nature of yourself and the nature of, of reality. Uh, at the same time, the world is clearly really screwed up, and maybe, uh, maybe it's become a little more credible than it was not so long ago. Anyway, what is the doctrine of the fall? The doctrine of the fall is the belief that all human beings are sinners, and that this proclivity or tendency towards sin isn't just a kind of surface problem, but actually has taken root deep in our nature. Although we are good, fundamentally, God made us good, nevertheless, something has taken root deep down that is not so good. Sin is a kind of disease of the will. It's why we constantly think about ourselves more than others, why we fail to love and tend to others as we should. Something in us has gotten turned away from God and his way of being. One thing that this means is that sin, if you want to talk about sin or fallenness, it's not in the first instance something that we do. It's not actions first. First, it's a condition from which we suffer. To say that human beings are fallen is a way of describing the fact that there is a kind of fundamental bug in the human system as we experience it right now. It's an explanation for why that system keeps throwing up errors. The doctrine of sin is a way of saying that reality is like a lens with a subtle but pervasive flaw, such that everything that goes through it gets a little bit distorted. Say another way, it's a description of the fact that there is a kind of bias against flourishing that appears to be written into human hearts, at least to some degree. Not always, but it's, 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 it's never far. So we have to think of sin as a kind of condition of our souls, and it causes great suffering. Now, a lot of people, uh, more articulate than me, have, uh, have talked about this condition of human fallenness. Martin Luther King Jr. called it, quote, this glaring reality of the gone wrongness of human nature. The novelist John Updike describes it as, quote, our sensation that something is amiss. There has been a lapse or slippage in the world. It's a great, there's been a lapse or slippage in the world, and things are not quite as they should be. Somehow, Updike says, we feel made for a better world, and we sense that somehow the fault is ours, that this is not Eden. The philosopher and novelist Iris Murdoch was not a Christian, but she believed very strongly in original sin. She once wrote that the problem with much modern philosophy is that it doesn't have a doctrine of original sin, and therefore cannot really deal with, quote, the fact that so much human conduct is moved by mechanical energy of an egocentric kind philosophy for today just couldn't actually get a grip on a lot of what was actually going on in reality for human beings. T.S. Eliot, with whom I'm mildly obsessed, um, uh, in one of his plays has a character describe how she comes to experience this sense of, 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 of the fall uh, in herself. In her deepest self, she's come to feel, quote, a feeling of emptiness, of failure towards someone or something outside of myself. It's as if a curse is written on the underside of things. 
So Genesis 3 tells us the story of how this condition came about. It describes an event that changed everything. In the fall narrative in Genesis, the eating of the apple is not just a one-off event. It's something that changed the human condition at a fundamental level. Like many of us, this is an obvious transition. Like many of us, I've been mildly obsessed, not just with T.S. Eliot over the past few years, but also with Stranger Things. I've watched uh, every episode multiple times, uh, the first two seasons maybe five times, for what that's worth. Um, I think this show provides a powerful analogy for our fallen state. Many of you will know, some of you will not, maybe most of you not, I don't know. Uh, basically, the show is about um, this young girl with psychic powers who accidentally opens a, a portal, a rift in reality that, uh, that goes into this world of, of darkness, um, this terrible place called the Upside Down. And essentially, the plot line in each season is that this rift in reality um, starts to infect the world in a different way. Sometimes it's tentacles crawling under the town, sometimes it's people being mind controlled, sometimes it's just a monster. But in every season, the, 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 the primal wound uh, that was caused um, is, is infecting the, 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 the goodness of the town and needs to be fought, usually by this wonderful, courageous girl, Eleven. Um, and uh, you know, of course, every time she seems to close the portal, it opens back up again. So um, that's why uh, they need Jesus, not just Eleven, I think, to close the portal. Um, <laughs> But in the end of season two, it's the, not the best season, but it's the best ending of a season, just, just saying. Um, the, uh, the, the, it, the, the analogy is, it's not just that the world has a rift in it, in Stranger Things. It's that somehow this wound is, it matches something in Eleven. She, the, 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 this, she gets told right at this climactic moment. So she's standing, for those of you who can't, can't, haven't seen it, can't remember it, she's standing on this platform underground in front of this giant rift that's getting bigger and bigger to this, this world of darkness. And these tentacles are trying to come through it to, to make everything bad. And uh, she's told this. She it says, you have a wound, Eleven, a terrible wound. And it's festering. And it will grow, spread. And eventually, it will kill you. This is what the doctrine of original sin says about human beings. There is a portal to the upside down somewhere. Uh, in, inside of us that is constantly, it's not the whole story, but it's constantly there trying to infect, trying to distort. That's what's happened in, uh, that we read about in Genesis. And it kills you. You know, death, this, the fall causes, causes death. So, what is it that's happened? How did the fall of humanity from grace come about? Genesis tells the story of a tragedy in a primal garden. You know the story, we've just heard it read. God has created Adam and Eve in a beautiful place to live, full of life, filled with God's presence. There's just one rule, to not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. But there's a serpent in the garden, and the serpent convinces the couple to eat the fruit from the tree. They do eat, and after this, humanity, and the world in which humanity lives and labors, is never the same again. The first thing that happens in the text, after eating the apple, is that Adam and Eve suddenly come to feel ashamed of themselves for the first time, the famous moment of sewing on the fig leaves because they felt that they were naked. God has created them. Uh, no, sorry. Um, verse 7 tells us, they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Shame, psychologists tell us, is an emotional state where you feel that others perceive you as worthless. When we feel shame, we don't want to look people in the eye. It's a classic uh, indicator of shame. We want to hide, we want to sink into the floor, just disappear. That's why it's different from guilt. Shame is you want to erase yourself. Knowing that they have done wrong, Adam and Eve are now convinced that God will find them worthless. So they hide from God. I always think this is a slightly comical thing. A, the idea that you can hide from God is ridiculous, but also, like, are they behind a tree? Are they under a bush? You know. Um, but nevertheless, there they are. They try to hide. That's their instinct now in the context of the fall. And let's face it, we can all relate to this. This is not a million miles away. We all have the instinct to hide our flaws. Well, I have the instinct. I'm sure you don't. The instinct to hide our flaws from others, to try to keep people from knowing about the certain things we've done, certain things we do. 
uh, in the previous uh, story I'm about to tell, in the previous service, I had to pretend it wasn't about one of my kids because he was in the church, but I'll just tell you the, the normal version now because um, he's, <laughs> he's, he's gone. Uh, one of my children, um, we, 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 you know, had, like all parents, you know, try to regulate screens as best you can so they can only do it on the weekends or certain kind of times and for fixed periods, but there came a point where um, the game Roblox, which is like crack for five-year-olds, is... Um, <laughs> Uh, just really got a grip on my, my dear boy. And uh, he, um, so whenever you sort of suddenly get silence from a five-year-old, something's up, but you don't notice at first because it's, it's silence and you're finally getting to do what you want to do. But um, one, one Saturday morning, we're sort of like, we haven't seen Arthur in a while. Uh, hmm. So we start looking around, looking around the house. Uh, is he in, you know, is he in the kitchen? Uh, is he in his room? Is he in his bed? Is he in, on the toilet? Um, who knows? We look everywhere. We can't find him. Finally, we come into the living room. In the back of the living room, there's a big couch. And uh, we say, Arthur, are you here? <laughs> this little head and this little iPad come up over the back of the couch. And he has this terrible look on his face because he's been caught. He's been hiding, sneaking Roblox. Uh, and, uh, but also he knows, but he, he, it stuck with us so much this event because it was the first time we'd ever experienced him sort of being deceitful, but also just recognizing that he was feeling shame. He was hiding. He wanted to, he thought he could get away somehow by, like Adam and Eve, you know, by, by hiding, uh, with his crime. Uh, so, uh, that's what Adam, uh, and Eve do. Once they're discovered, Adam and Eve do another classic human thing. They do something also that was inconceivable before the fall had taken place. They try to deflect the blame. Now it's important, uh, they don't actually lie, but they do spread the blame. So when a God asks Adam if he has eaten from the tree, Adam uh, presents the truth in a way that he hopes will lessen the judgment by kind of sharing the load. First thing he says, the woman. That's the first thing he says. The woman you put here with me, she gave some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So Adam basically throws Eve under the bus instantly. Um, this is the fall. When God then turns to question Eve, she is on the exact same page. Maybe she's mad at him for what he's just done. But anyway, she says, the serpent deceived me. The serpent, her first words, not me, serpent, but me too. The serpent deceived me and I ate it. Like Adam, she doesn't lie, but also like Adam, she is not exactly taking full responsibility either. And who can't relate to this? Uh, anyone who's grown up in a family knows the drill. Some bad thing has happened. Some, someone's crying or is wounded or a lamp is broken or something. Mom comes in and asks what's happened. Each child blames the other or some circumstance uh, outside of their control or at least tries to sort of drag their sibling down with them. You know, he, he hit me on the arm, but she kicked me first. I didn't kick him that hard. Anyway, he broke my Lego. It was an accident. I didn't mean to break your Lego. Yeah, you did. Well, anyway, you know the story. They're trying to deflect blame. And by the way, this is something that nations also do. Uh, nations, too, are subject to the fall. So uh, again, we're not a million miles from, from contemporary life when we're reading this story. Both Adam and Eve's reactions after eating the fruit, I think we could say they actually reflect a deeper problem that has occurred. Both hiding from judgment and deflecting blame are symptoms of a more fundamental tragedy. They're symptoms of a broken relationship, above all with God, that then distorts all their other relationships. Before, they did not hide from God. They were not self-conscious. Imagine being completely unselfconscious. Um, before, they lived in harmony with each other. Now, they throw each other under the bus at the snap of a finger if it means escaping or mitigating judgment. Another way of putting this is that Adam and Eve no longer trust that God loves them, that his will for them is good. They think they have to take matters into their own hands or something terrible will happen. They've become islands, isolated from each other, protecting their little territory rather than living in openness and trust. They fear they are no longer beloved of God. And this fear is sadly built on a lie. God loves them just as much. But now there's a new state of things. There is a fog, a disturbance. The communication signals between humanity and God are no longer functioning properly. 
They're misunderstanding what God thinks. Here, too, it doesn't take much imagination or life experience to know that this is our condition as well. How much time we spend trying to convince other people to notice us, to care for us, to love, for, to love us, we think we have to do it ourselves. Also, how bad we are at communicating. Um, I am convinced that 95% of human conversation is basically people just taking turns talking about themselves. Um, uh, not, not you guys, but again, it's always me who, um, yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a car New Yorker cartoon from years ago uh, in which these two people are, are having, a, having a chat. And one of them says, enough about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> that is the, the world of relational breakdown that we now live in. And even in the best of relationships with people, even where there is communication, it's hard. It's hard now to communicate to people. It's hard to get through, to be understood, to really see other people. It wasn't before, it is now. That's the fall. And sometimes we can't get through at all. We feel like ships in the fog sending out our signals and just no one's, no one's receiving them. So the first feature of the new condition of fallenness is the breakdown of relationship with God and with each other. The story of Adam and Eve is our story. There are walls up between us that were not there before. When we turned away from God, something cracked in the world, and a fog came in. The second consequence of the fall in the passage is the introduction of pain and toil. This is such an uh, uplifting um, talk. Um, pain and toil. Uh, pain in childbirth as well as pain at work. God tells Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. So let me ask you, how's your, how's your work going? Well, whatever week of, of, of term or uh, whatever it might be. Uh, how's your work going? Is it all just completely smooth sailing? No problems, no angst, no existential crises, um, no fear of judgment. Um, Hopefully, it's going great. I, I hope that sincerely. Um, I'm not any of your director of studies, so. Um, some of us experience the thorns and thistles of work in the form of uh, procrastination. Work is so painful, we hide from it any way we can. If, if, if we wouldn't procrastinate if work weren't cursed <laughs> uh, in, in, in this sense of this passage. Um, and uh, I mean, it may be that in my you know, own university life, uh, I spent a lot of time finding anything to do that was not my work, just absolutely anything. There was something pathological about how hard I uh, found it. So that's about me. Um, but also, sometimes work is the other way. It's like a slave master, and you're just living, it, you just, it's always there, it's always on your mind. You're always, it's never enough over and over and over again. Uh, and that's true in jobs, uh, as it's true um, in, uh, in university. All these things are the thorns and thistles of our relationship to work after the fall. What the doctrine of the fall tells us is that these are not one-off problems or accidents of, a, of your or my circumstances. The thorns and the thistles are now built into the nature of the thing. There's a lot more to say about this passage. I haven't even talked about the darkest consequence of the fall at all, the introduction of death, of mortality. Uh, dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. We grow old and our bodies begin to fail. I don't, that's, that's, most of you probably don't relate to that yet. Um, I, I would, told them, er, the earlier congregation, they, they laughed at me for this very trivial uh, story, but um, I, I developed arthritis in my toe like two, two years ago, and it means it's, I can't always run and I have to do all this stuff to manage it. And um, you know, obviously arthritis in the toe is not you know, the deep consequence of, of the violation of the relationship between God and humanity, but <laughs> But uh, it was, I went to this, I finally got through to a podi podiatrist, and, uh, and the, the guy was like, yeah, um, so this is never going to go away. It can only be managed. There are things you can do to manage it, but basically you're stuck with this. This is, and, and so it was existentially like, ah, all of a sudden, my body's just going to get worse <laughs> from here on out. And that had never been, been the case before. That, this is all because of Adam and Eve. Um, <laughs> But don't worry about that yet. Um, anyway, so here we see these key features of our fallen condition. We live under circumstances of relational break breakdown, and this is also true at societal levels. Our instinct is to doubt that we are loved, that we could ever be loved if people knew our true selves. We fear God and we hide from him and from each other instead of running to God with our needs and problems. 
Our labor in the world is often painful and difficult instead of easy and natural. And we live in bodies that begin to decline almost as soon as we become aware of how wonderful they are. So, okay, Simeon, thanks a lot. Great. We've had all negativity uh, so far. So what now? What do we do about the primal wound, about the condition of fallenness? I have a few things to say. And the first is to acknowledge it. If you find it hard to think of, uh, I would say look at the symptoms of your life. Maybe, maybe there is something to this. Maybe it may be that uh, there is a malady here that goes beyond just the one-off details. Do you see your wound? Are you hiding behind the couch? I would say don't hide behind platitudes about how we all have good intentions or how everything's getting better or how as soon as X happens, all my problems will go away. Sometimes those things are true. Most of the time they're not. And we need to be honest about our condition. Healing begins with accurate diagnosis. Perhaps we are all afflicted with the universal malady, the sickness of the soul that was first contracted in a garden long ago. Perhaps that helps make sense of the life that we see around us and in the world. Having acknowledged it, the second thing to do is to ask for help, because there is help. There is help. The clue about the help lies in a later passage in the New Testament. At a crucial point in his letter to the Romans, in uh, chapter 5, Paul discusses at some length these exact events from Genesis 3. Theology, it's one of the major commentaries on Genesis 3, theologically. Uh, but anyway, that's what it is. He, there he makes explicit what I've been trying to show, that Adam here in Genesis is us. Adam is us. He represents all of fallen humanity, and his crime has become our crime and is symbolic of us. As Paul puts it in Romans 5, quote, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Again, a few verses later, one man's trespass led to condemnation for all by the one man's disobedient, disobedience. The many were made sinners. But in this passage, Paul doesn't stop there. Basically what he says is, things are really bad because of Adam, but Christ has come, and he is so much bigger and better than Adam. Jesus has come to fix, to heal, to close the gate, to, to, to forgive the, our sin, to heal the wound, and his healing is so much greater, and his mercy is so much greater than the, than the wound ever was. Paul's really keen to get at this sense that the goodness is greater than the badness. This is what he says, God proves his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, Adam, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? The whole purpose of Jesus coming into the world was to heal the primal wound and to forgive the primal sin, the primal crime. He came because of it. He didn't come to spite your wound. He came because of it. It's not an accident that we call Jesus the great physician. That's one of the lovely names for Jesus, the great physician. By his death, our sin is undone, and its consequences are even now being unraveled. Relationships will be restored, our labors will be redeemed, and death itself will be reversed. When Jesus took breath again after his death in the tomb, he was not just coming back to life, he was reversing this curse. He was changing, he was repairing the fabric of reality uh, in a very profound way. And what that means, so partly that means we have a lot to hope for, a lot to look forward to, <laughs> that this is not the end, uh, and um, all will be well, and all manner of things shall be well, as Julian of Norwich uh, famously says, but it also means, you know, this, this condition, we experience the condition of, of fallenness in specific ways that are particular to our lives, and uh, in particular relational breakdown, uh, in particular forms of pain. And, uh, and that means that not only do we trust in hope of a future resurrection, we also can bring these things to God now, um, the particular form that this condition, particular symptoms that you are suffering from in your condition. You can bring them even now to the great physician. 
perhaps the most lovely and compassionate thing I, that has ever been said about sin in my professional opinion uh, is what Jesus says in Matthew 9 when he's asking why he is spending so much time with tax collectors and sinners. It's several Gospels, but in Matthew 9, Jesus says this, you know, why do you spend so much time with tax collectors and sinners? And he says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. I see the analogy between sickness and sin. By calling it sickness, it communicates compassion. He has this enormous compassion in whatever wound or uh, guilt you are, are suffering from. And uh, he has come. It is, what it means is that it's in your sin that God meets you. God himself has come to lie down with you behind the couch. And something about grace, not only has God come down to lie down with you, that in the great alchemy of God's redemption of the world, he's actually come to sit down and play Roblox with you in the back. Things are completely turned upside down and for the good. Maybe not Roblox, it's an awful game, but um, that's, uh, that's what his coming means. And it's why we're free to be honest about the wounds that we carry, why in spite of everything, we need not despair. Our malady is in the hands of the great physician, and there is no sickness uh, or injury he cannot heal. There is no sin he will not forgive. We're going to have a little bit of a time of response now, and um, I would just encourage you, I mean, maybe there's something, maybe there's something around confession. Um, to, to bring to the Lord. Maybe there's something where you need help. Some, you're suffering under some instantiation of the human condition and you need specific concrete help. Bring it to God. Bring your wound, your suffering, your burden, whatever it might be, whether it's relational or, or something else. And maybe, I mean, some of us are like, actually, we know all this. The world is terrible and I'm a dumpster fire. I know that. My problem is that I can't believe it, uh, that I'm, I'm in despair. And that too you can bring to God. There, there is hope. Hope is one of the ways in which we are helped in our, uh, in our despair. So do, do um, bring those things to the Lord and do come up uh, if, you, if you feel like it. There's something about it that is, is special when you do. Um, but amen. <laughs>